Yeah, I'm, I'm so happy. I, I love your work, that's fantastic. And I'm happy to follow after this talk because it raises, uh, while on the other side, it raises some interesting and similar questions. And yeah. So I'm delighted to see interest in our work, Partip participatory evaluation with autistic children, or PEACE for short. It is the result of a collaboration between myself, Laura Malinverni, Judith Good, and Christopher Fraunberger. Before I start, I want to clarify that I say autistic children instead of children with autism, because according to Lorcan Kenny and others, this is the predominantly self-chosen form of address. And additionally, in the realm of identity politics, autistic people lobby for exactly this type of language. To provide you with context for the work we evaluated in our paper, I have to talk a bit about outside the box. Outside the Box is a three-year-long lasting research project in which we co-design technologies with autistic children. So predominantly, technologies for autistic children are focused on perceived functional deficits. So in evaluating these, extrinsic measures are used. And that can be the amount of correctly diagnosed children or behavior changes dependent on the use case of said technology. But the thing is, I, don't, I think these technologies are still useful and our critique does not go against them as is, but rather at the lack of technologies for the holistic well-being of autistic children. And we, as allistic, meaning non-autistic researchers, do that in Outside the Box and co-design technologies with autistic children that afford positive experiences. Our technologies aim to be fun and make sense in children's lives. So we have to co-design them in order to create positive experiences they can share with others. We do so by an extensive design process with each individual child spanning over multiple sessions over the span of more than a year. Autism is diagnosed in about one in 68 children and classically defined along the following characteristics. Differences in reciprocal socio-communicative interaction and repetitive interests and behaviors. However, de Jaeger describes an embodied approach in which experiences are inherently tied to the ways in which autistic people perceive the world around them. This can be fundamentally different to the way holistic people perceive the world or their environment. For example, autistic people might be much more sensitive to audio and in order to have more control over their sound environment, they might make repetitive noises. And these repetitive behaviors are then meaningful in that they create positive sensory experiences to them. This also affects how autistic people make sense of the world as information might be processed differently and hence made sense of it differently. However, sense making is not an isolated but rather a participatory process. Others contribute to the act of sense making in that they provide further input. However, often this participatory sense making can happen in ways you might not expect. I'm just giving this background to make sure while I think that participatory evaluation is important for any kinds of people we work with, it becomes especially important or especially pronounced as a method when we work with autistic children. So why? Many technologies for autistic children have been developed without their direct input. Recent years have changed that, and more and more research projects involve autistic children directly in the design of technologies concerning them. However, evaluation is rare, and if it happens, it's driven by researchers' goals and approaches, often with a focus on parents' and teachers' carers' perspectives only. This means that there are quite a few methods and insights available in how to engage autistic children in design, for example, Benton's ideas, but in order to evaluate the technologies we co-create with the children in Outside the Box, we need to know whether and how they are meaningful to them. It means we need to actively participate in how they make sense about the technologies they co-created with us. Participatory evaluation is generally rare in HCI and up until now has been, to my knowledge, or to ours, non-existent for autistic children or children in general. Children's roles in design have been extensively conceptualized, and just again, we've seen the conceptualization of children and adults' roles together. So, but when it comes to evaluation, they're kind of conceptually limited to the role of a passive tester 
And I think testers can not just be passive, they can actively participate in what they test. So we propose to include them more actively in the evaluation of technologies that concern them. And that also means we have to take ourselves back as researchers a little, or not just a little. Um, <laughs> this comes with two advantages making space for the agency of the child, and conveniently, getting more information about the child's perspective on a given technology. For this, we came up with a three-step process. Setting goals, gathering data, and interpreting results. All three of them are done in a radically participatory fashion. In setting goals, the children are encouraged to articulate them. This does not always have to be verbally and it's the researcher's task to offer several options for articulating the goals along the abilities and interests of the child, or even across children, if you work with more. Researchers can also offer different goals to investigate, but they will only be pursued if they make sense to the child, and they indicate interest in following it up. Children also take the lead in gathering the data, and researchers prompt and support the child when needed, and if necessary, researchers then pre-process the data and meet together with the children to interpret the results together. In order to make this a little more tangible to you, I will now walk through one of the case studies together with you. The paper contains three. If you're interested in more variety in how the peace process can look like, you should look at the paper. Um, the three prototypes we created in that context are from left to right, an enjoyable Mario-themed alarm system, a time machine, and sound boxes to share messages. And probably you were asking what a time machine is. I will look at that in particular. The background for this object is Ivan's interest in planet and space. He is very enthusiastic about these topics and would tell anyone about them, regardless of whether they were interested and even already knew about the topic through him. So in order to make his stories about time and space more interesting for both him and his audience, we uh, developed the time machine. It consists, in the background you see that in red, of a blanket with LEDs and control, and a control that's in the foreground in yellow. The blanket spans over two chairs, and the control influences when and in which patterns the lights blink and travel. Two or three people can sit under the blanket and go on a time travel together and it's narrated by Ivan. Often, he gives the control, um, like the yellow thing, to others and just narrates their joint adventure full of crashes, problems, and discoveries. And instead of a monologue, it becomes a shared endeavor. So when we were defining the goals, how we could evaluate that, Ivan was actually very expressive. He told us that he wanted to share the invention with his brother and see whether he likes it as well. He also told us that the time machine should be really fast. The latter one puzzled us because while the lights blink in a pattern, there was no speed as such. So, um, and having the lights blink faster, we tried that as well because it's a direct translation, did not actually make it fast for him. <laughs> so we had to find out what he meant with it and discover ways in which to assess it. For that particular problem, like the speed, we conducted a TV show similar to the YouTube videos Ivan was interested in, and we called it Research with Ivan. And in those, he basically told the same story each time, how he was traveling with the time machine that day and during the design iterations. However, one day he was very animate about how the time machine was, was finally super fast and that he was very excited about that. For the other part in sharing with his brother, we could, uh, we conducted a session in which they both were drawing a picture together. This is this picture. You can see how Ivan in red is quite a lot larger than his brother who is also sitting and that they are together under the blanket. Um, there are two different controls indicating that it might be great to have an individual one for each of the children. And to the upper left you see one outside participant observing and the blanket is indicated by a point cloud and with the planets above. I really like this picture. Um, we interpreted it together in that we looked at the video and the picture together and discussed it, and we understood, for, in terms of speed, that certain planets have different light patterns for Ivan, and 
a fast light pattern is one that suits the planets he wants to go to. So in that regard, the attribute of speed can be translated into an attribute of immersion. And only um, like in pursuing this goal, which was initially really unclear to us what was meant, we understood more about the dimension of his experience with the time machine. And that example also shows how you radically follow any type of interest that the child expresses. Through the drawing, we understood that Ivan's brother felt part of the time travel and had his place there. And he did like interacting with it. And in that regard, we were very happy to see that the technology was literally shared with others. We also talk a little bit about roles, I'm sorry, and not relationships. <laughs> but in a process of participatory evaluation of autistic children, researchers and children co-construct the meanings of a technology. In a radical notion, only goals are investigated that make sense to the children. Other evaluation can accompany peace, but they are not part of it. Participatory evaluation is one method that can be used amongst others to understand more about the meaning technologies have to participants researchers work with. Peace requires researchers to make space for the agency of autistic children. While they bring knowledge about, like the researchers, bring knowledge about uh, potential goals and evaluation methods, they also have to actively work on not taking over too much space. And that happens more easily than one might think. However, the value comes with the unique insights researchers gain. Each individual of our cases has provided us with novel insights, and across them we also saw a range of possibilities in how this process can take shape. And we will further investigate the limits and opportunities of participatory evaluation with autistic children or other populations, but we cannot do this alone, so I would like to invite you to use the approach and tell us about your experience, because we'd really like to find out more about how th this could work. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lane Hubbard again. Really, really amazing work. It just makes me so, so happy to hear about the time machine and the planetary light patterns. I think that's phenomenal. Um, what this has me thinking of is neurodiversity, and I think that your work has a lot of implications for helping each child, children who have gone through trauma, like the person from Baltimore was talking about, children who have just their own sensitivities, their own re reasons for being, their own souls, helping them access themselves and helping them make sense of their own worlds first. How do you see us going forward with bringing this to, to children who have a special story to tell? I'm so interested in finding out. I don't want to make any assumptions, but I'm really interested in finding this out. Would you? Come with me. Very cool, of <laughs> course, definitely. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, Margot Bruton from QUT. Um, we're doing some work in this space as well. And I really like the presentation. I just wanted to ask a little bit more about, I'm sorry to do the definitional thing about children with autism or autistic children, because my understanding of this uh, issue is that um, Adults, or autistic adults, want, don't want to be called adults with autism because they... Um, I'm listening. Uh, because they, 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 they identify it as part of their being and so they don't want to sort of have it tagged on like that. But I, w I wonder because children are still developing their identities and the, the diagnosis is so sort of variable and people change so much over time, the extent to which we... How you think about that in terms of children? I have the feeling that to children um, themselves in how they are situated in their lives with school and everything else, there is a lot of people, when we talk about autism, we usually talk about them and it's not that relevant to their identity yet in that age group. We work with six to 10 year old children. Yeah. Um, so I do take the advice that I hear from the adults because that is the one where it's later matters and I hope I'm doing the right thing. I've actually thought very long about the yeah. language I've used yeah. and I have really extensively looked into this and I yeah. do only hope that I do something right there and I really hope that 
someone will tell me if I don't anymore. I know, I mean, the first is, obviously you think about it, and we're, we're struggling with it too, and we, we took the opposite approach, which, so that's why I'm interested in it, which was to say, we, we say um, children with, we, in our papers, say we understand there's a language issue. We know that adults identifying with, want to be called autistic adults, but for the moment we're going to say, put the children, children-centred language, so children first and the children with autism, but... Uh, there's no right answer, so... Yeah. I mean, essentially, they're both. They're autistic and they're children, so it's always an issue, and I don't want to put anything f in yeah. front of the other, actually, so maybe it would be best yeah. if I would change it more, but... I think it's more that the, the aspects to do with diagnosis are so problematic. If you look at all the infrastructure in literature, you know, you know the, so, some people are diagnosed because that's the only way they can get treatment, is to have that category, because then they can get funding and so on, so it... The, the, there are lots of, you know, you know how complex it is. I mean. <laughs> Thank you so much for your comment. Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, I once also thought about uh, developing an interactive storytelling project for children with uh, autism to develop their social emotional cognition, but uh, I had a difficulty to fund those kind of children and uh, get the IRB approved. So I was wondering how do you re recruit your participants and uh, the, for the design guidelines, is there any difference between children with autism and uh, just uh, ordinary kids? Yeah. So I don't think there are any ordinary kids, but that's me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, children without autism. Yeah. It's okay. Um, so, like, I wasn't talking about design, and there are some things that you have to do a little different in order to attune to children who are autistic um, in general. And in terms of ethics and how we got to our participants, the thing is our institution does not have an RIB. So we have an uh, internal project, internal ethics review thing that is also going within the institute. We are like asking people to reflect and, and like reflect within ourselves all the time and have these micro-ethical decisions where we are like in the moment making decisions and we try to be reflective about it, but there is no external, really, really external view on it. Um, and we were, we were very lucky because we were working in Vienna and um, Vienna has the system where there are mentors. The city provides mentors to the children who are in integration schools, and we were basic, basically working through them. Thank you. Hi, <laughs> Kylie Sobel, University of Washington. I had a question about the interpreting results um, sec like process. I was just thinking about sometimes how we're not like even as adults, not always self-aware of our own like reasons for doing things, and for children, sometimes. I, like in my experience with uh, participatory design, sometimes I'll ask why they did something and then just say, I don't know. And that happens with me too. And so I'm wondering in that, for that step, how you think what adults can do to try, or to try and interpret, uh, interpret the results and have children be part of that process when they might not be completely self-aware of the choices that they made. That is a great question. And please don't take this as an attack, but we don't ask why questions. We ask what, we ask how, we ask who, when, but we don't ask why, because why is a really difficult question to answer for anyone. So we try to like, not ask why. No, I didn't, that's not an attack. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs>